For the 2018 Ripcord reunion, I'm talking now with Buzz Ireland of Keatesville, Pennsylvania, or Maryland rather, not Pennsylvania, Maryland. Uh, and um, interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? I was born in Baltimore, Maryland on March 29th, and um, you know, you have two engines you have to monitor. Uh, it's just so many different systems on it and so forth. Uh, you're picking up loads from the middle of the aircraft and how you maneuver to pick them up and to drop them and, and carrying stuff, how you maneuver the aircraft to keep from losing the load, all of those types of things. Mm -hmm. And so does the co-pilot have a whole set of things that he has to be doing? In the smaller aircraft, sometimes the co-pilot is just there in case the other guy gets hit. But for a Chinook, what's the co-pilot doing? Well, a, what you do s split off the flying, but okay. when you have emergencies, it requires two. So unless you have an emergency, he's really not needed. Okay. Um, but generally, the the uh, pilot what, is flying. He's talking to the pathfinder on the ground about bringing the load in, and the co-pilot would be handling the other radios, talking to okay. whomever he'd have to. So the pilot can concentrate just on the pathfinder, or he would be the co-pilot will be talking somewhat with the door gunners if if they're shooting because of incoming. But the pilot and the flight engineer who's working the load, the whole, okay. they are always in communication with each other. Okay. So it's the flight engineer who's in charge of, of raising and lowering loads and releasing things? and The flight engineer, it's his aircraft. Mm -hmm. He's the boss of that aircraft. And they took great pride. So you always had a flight engineer a crew chief and a door gunner assigned to the aircraft. They mm -hmm. didn't switch around. Okay. It was their aircraft. So they took great pride in keeping the aircraft up, um, keeping it mechanically correct. It was the flight engineer's job to train the crew chief to become a flight engineer, and the crew chief's job to train the door gunner to become a crew chief. Mm -hmm. And that's how, with the rotation of people out and in, Okay. It so since they're coming in to be a crewman on a, a helicopter rather than a pilot, there's a sequence there. So you bring them into the bottom and you train them and they all right. work their way up. They move their way up. All right. Okay. So at this point, are you starting to wonder if maybe the Vietnam War will end before you get in it? or No. <laughs> I mean, you had Ted of 68 mm -hmm. and, you know, I did my training through 69. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was it was it was going pretty strong. Okay, all right. So when you now complete the Chinook training, uh, will your next stop be Vietnam? Yes, okay. I had uh, thirty days of leave mm -hmm. and then off to Nam. Okay. Uh, now at this point, uh, were you still single or? No, I got married at when I was at um, Hunter Army Airfield. Okay. And what did your wife think about your taking off for Vietnam? Or was that just assumed that was going to happen? Well, she knew that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. All right. How did you feel about it? I knew it was going to happen. I mean, that's, that was the way it was. Okay. And I guess you was I scared? Well, sure, I was mm -hmm. scared. Everybody was nervous. But it was what you trained for, essentially. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. All right. So what's the process to get you to Vietnam? Well, uh, I flew from uh, on commercial airline from Beta, no, from Dulles, out to the West Coast to Oakland, California, and then got on military transport. Flew. They stopped in Hawaii, and then we flew into Benoit, okay. Vietnam, and arrived about two o'clock in the morning, January first. 1970. Okay. What's your first impression of Vietnam when you get there? Hot and sticky. 
nice air conditioned aircraft walk out and that hits you mm -hmm. and we were in khakis and you immediately start perspiring you know your underarms are sopping wet right away and then it starts on your back and mm -hmm. your chest and just soaking through all right what do they do with you at Benoit well they put us on a bus officers only going to the officer's replacement the bus was like a school bus but green uh, the windows were down but over the windows were uh, like chicken wire so that nobody could throw a grenade through okay so, and then they take us off but they take us off base we don't have a weapon now the driver has a pistol on him I think it's a 45 but we don't have a weapon and of course, I don't know what's going on. I'm scared. Good Lord. So I take my duffel bag and I put it next to me against the outside of the uh, bus. And I kind of scoop way down so only this much is above <laughs> so I can look out. Because I'm thinking, you know, somebody's going to shoot us. And everybody was complaining, don't we have weapons? Da 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 da. And there were like maybe 10 of us on this bus. Mm -hmm. But, you know, no incidents happen. We get there. But, you know, the first, you know, heck, when I stepped off the plane, I expected, you know, artillery or mortar rounds or whatever to be coming in, and we'd be dodging those, trying to get to where we went. Nothing like that happened. But that's what you thought. You had no concept of what was going on. So we get to the repo depot, signed a bunk, crawl on your bunk, and it just seems like a few minutes later they wake and get you up at 6 o'clock in the morning. I remember we landed at 2. Mm -hmm. and by the time you get to go through all this and get there, it must have been uh, 4 o'clock when we got there. So we got maybe a couple hours mm -hmm. sleep. And you get dressed and you go to breakfast. And then they sit you down and start interviewing you. What, did you, what do you do? Da, 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 da. Where do you want to go? Da da da. And I asked for the 101st, being an airborne person. Mm -hmm. And that's where I got assigned. Okay. Uh, and then now what happens? Then you get transport up to the 101st. So I uh, went from Benoit up to Way, Fubai, mm -hmm. Fubai Airport, where on a C 130 where we got off and again you report in and then they put us up for the night and then the next day they put us on cattle cars or what I'll say and they drive you all the way up from way or through from Fubai through way up to Camp Evans where you spend a week of in-country training that the 101st has. All right. And what did that consist of? Of pretending you're an infantryman, mm -hmm. which for me was not a big deal, but for the warrant officers and so forth, they bitched and complained <laughs> and this and that because they had to stand guard in the trenches and they had to walk in the jungle with, with their M16s and learn all about the booby traps and this and that, you know, the situation of what was going on. Uh, that's where I first got introduced to uh, marijuana and all the drugs that they have because they have a class showing you all this stuff and to be on the lookout that this was stuff that you're not supposed to say. Mm -hmm. So you went through the same training that they did? Every, every 101st person goes through that training, no matter what your job. Okay. But in this case, but you were familiar with the infantry stuff already because you've yes, done Yes, because I was an infantry officer. Yeah. So that wasn't a big deal for me to do it. It was like playing an yeah. infantry officer again. But the others complained. Okay. All right. You get through that. Now, now what happens? Then um, we got on a Chinook and we're flying back and uh, to the battalion headquarters. And the people we were flying back happened to have been Playtex people, C Company. That Playtex was their call sign. 
and they were telling us, you know, that's the, that's the best company, that's the one you want. So, you know, we had to choose a company. So, when we got to the battalion, they said, where do you want to go? I said, C Company. So that's the company I was assigned to. So this is C Company of what battalion? 159th Assault Support Helicopter Battalion. Okay. Uh, and that's, again, been part of the 101st Airborne. Okay. Right. All right. So that, that is now your unit. And where were they based? They were based at Liftmaster Pad, which is beside Fubai Airport. Okay. Now, was that uh, within the larger compound of Camp Eagle, or was it outside of it? No, Camp Eagle was <coughs> a couple miles away, mm -hmm. but this was the compound around Fubai Airport. Okay. Uh, and who was guarding that? Were there, we. Okay, the Americans guarding that? Or yes. Was, did you have any infantry, or was it just the men from your unit? Well, we were assigned a section of the perimeter, okay. which our unit had to do. And a company that was actually on the airport of Fubai, they had a section that they had to do. So, yeah, and all the other, were there infantrymen there? Oh, yeah, there were infantrymen. But, you know, everybody had yeah. sections of the berm, so okay. the whole thing was. All right. Uh, and now when you join uh, C Company, what kind of reception do you get? <laughs> Well, you're the FNG, the new guy, and um, you know you're 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 welcome with open arms. And of course, that night uh, they start start you drinking in the bar because we had three bars in the company: an enlisted bar, an NCO bar, and the officers' bar. The officers' bar was in the officers' area, open twenty four seven honor system, you had your name on the wall, with a grease pencil you put a mark if you know got, got a beer or got a hard liquor or you got a soda or you got a snack and at the end of the month he paid up. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, middle of the night if you were thirsty for a coke, walk over in the refrigerator, take a coke out, take the grease pencil and put a little mark on. Or if you wanted peanuts or whatever. Um, and then they had you drink a blue flame. You had to drink a blue flame before you could wear the company patch. Okay, and what is a blue flame? Well, it's a shot of liquor on fire. So it's a blue flame burning, and you had to down it. And there's a chick, trick to downing it. Number one, you don't want to wait too long. As soon as it's lit, you want to pick it up, put your thumb here, and then flip it in your mouth. And as soon as it goes in your mouth, the flame goes out. But people would spill it all over them and be burning, so they always had a wet towel standing by to put your face out. Now, a lot of the warrant officers had mustaches, and they got singed a lot of times. <laughs> so that was, that was the trick. Okay. And do you start flying right away, or what happens? Well, you... Your first time you start flying is you have to fly with the company IP and instructor pilot. Mm -hmm. And he puts you through your paces and so forth. And once you demonstrate that you can do what you're supposed to do, then you're released to fly and you're a Peter pilot. Doesn't matter what rank you are, you're a Peter pilot. And you're you, you're paired up with a person that's an aircraft commander who has got months in country, mm -hmm. knows the area, knows all the tricks of the trade on how to do things, and he teaches you how to really fly. Because mm -hmm. you, you are dangerous when you come out of Chinook transition. Yeah, you can fly the bird around, but you don't really know what to do, and they're the ones that teach you. Mm -hmm. All right, and then, and of course, when you're with them now, you're flying real missions and you're yes. getting shot at and the rest of the yes. things that can happen, and so you start to see what the possibilities are and what they do. Exactly, and I can remember we went into Fire Support Base Fuller up on the DMZ, and it was very dry and dusty, and we went in, and it was just dust. You couldn't see anything. And of course, at a hover, you cannot fly instruments. 
and I didn't know what to do. But my aircraft commander said, look out your right window and you'll see a spot that you can actually see the ground. And there was. There was a spot about that big around where there wasn't dust swirling. And I could then use that to hover the aircraft to keep from crashing. Mm -hmm. And there was one out the left side. But they didn't teach us that in flight school. That's what he taught me. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, you're there, uh, they're kind of beginning of the year, in 1970. Uh, initially, what, where were you flying to or what kinds of missions were you flying? Every mission that you can think of that the Chinook does uh, because the aircraft commander every morning when he went to operations was handed a clipboard with a list of the missions he was supposed to complete that day. So most of the missions we fly are resupplying fire support bases. So you're carrying sling loads of ammo food, water, uh, petroleum out to them. Um, if they're setting up a new fire base, you're carrying bunkers, uh, sandbags, um, concertina wire, everything to set up uh, the base. And then you bring the artillery pieces in to the fire support bases once the, ba once the base is set up. Are some of those loads harder to carry than others? The hardest one to carry is a Connex container, which is a steel box. That's the best way I can say it. That stands about 10 feet tall, uh, 5 or 6 feet wide, and 5 or 6 feet deep. Just kind of like a cargo container that you'd see on rail cars or on the it, back of a semi. Yes, yes like a big closet <laughs> and they just aren't steady in the wind so you can't fly at a hundred knots I mean sometimes you're chugging along at 10 and 15 20 knots to keep this thing because it would sway and it would sway way up and actually pull the aircraft so it was very difficult to um, to fly those that's the worst the artillery pieces with uh, a sling load under them of, uh, of uh, artillery shells, never a problem. Mm -hmm. um, fixed wings, picking up down fixed wings, they can start to fly on you, so that can be a problem. I uh, never had a problem flying a uh, picking up a helicopter and flying that. Um, yeah, I, you know, Connex is, uh, you know, I just hated <laughs> flying Connex containers. All right. And how far afield did you go, if you want to say the range of area that you covered? Da Nang was the farther south we went, mm -hmm. DMZ up north, Laos to the west, and South China Sea to the east. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So pretty much the entire... Uh, Northern i -Corp. Northern i -Corp, yeah. Anything Da Nang up. Yeah, okay. And, and pretty much where the 101st is operating at that point. Right. So. We supported the 101st, the Marines, and the 1st Arvin Division. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, at, when you're, now, when you're for the infantrymen, um, they're, what happens to them it can, it varies, depends on the time of year and the seasons and when the active campaigns are going. Uh, so, for the infantrymen who, who fought in the Ripcord campaign, for instance, things pick up steadily as the year progresses. So, they're doing a lot of patrolling in April and May and June, and then at Ripcord, things get really ugly in July. For a helicopter pilot, between January and June, is there much difference in what you were doing? Oh, yes. Um, during the monsoon season, when it rains, it's very difficult to fly in the mountains mm -hmm. because of the clouds. So you have some problems there of whether you can get to these fire support bases to uh, resupply them. Um, but in ripcord, <laughs> you, were, you were shot at all the time, doesn't matter. So when we put the fire base in, yeah, there were people shooting at you. When we resupplied it every day, they were shooting at you. 
And of course, it was really hell when we pulled them out on the 23rd of July. Okay. Now, the, it took them three tries to establish the fire base at, at Ripcord. The first one was, was in March, and they were actually trying on a different hilltop. Were you part of that attempt? Yes. Okay, what do you recall about that day? You just, you couldn't get in because of the fire. The 51 cows shooting at you and the AK-47s. And no matter how many different ways you tried, it was almost impossible to get in. Okay. Now, how was something like that coordinated? You'd have a whole, you'd have a group of helicopters coming in. Were you waiting for other people to go in ahead, or you were assigned what sortie that you were in? So the mm -hmm. first person to come in, pick up a load mm -hmm. at Evans, and take it out. He would be 15 minutes in front of you. So that's how you would do it. Um, when we were pulling it out, we were circling. And again, you were assigned what you were to go in and pick up and where you were in the line to do it. So when your time came, you went in, picked up, and pulled it out. Now, in that first effort to create the base when that of Ort sent, basically were you in a line someplace and the order comes, uh, no, we're not doing it, or did you actually get over to the hill they were supposed to go to and then pull away? You got over to the hill where the, and they were shooting at you and they called it off and you went back to Evans and okay. you dropped your load. All right. And then the second try is on April 1st, 1970, and this time actually going on to the hill that becomes Ripcord. Uh, and they do land some people and stuff there that day. Okay, that was the Hueys that landed okay. the people, not the Chinooks. Yeah. Right. We were bringing in the, the uh, materiel to establish the right. base. Okay, and that time did you ever get off the ground or did no. you? No. Okay. So it just was too hot to go in? And... Supposedly, yes. Okay. So. All right. Now, they eventually walk up the side of the hill and nobody shoots at them and they start building a base. Correct. Okay. And that's when we bring in everything. Mm -hmm. The bulldozer to create the holes to bring the bunkers that are built at Evans and put them in the holes, mm -hmm. the sandbags, the Constantina wire, the blivets of um, diesel fuel to run the generators, uh, all everything that they need up there, we haul it in. Okay. Did you bring in, um, did you use blivets of water or fresh water, did you bring that up there? Yes. Okay. So when you brought them in, they were big round blivets that the common, when you brought in and was in down uh, elephant nuts, uh, whether it was um, potable or non-potable. Mm -hmm. Non-potable would have been the, the diesel fuel potable would be the, the water, and that's how they could tell us where to put it. And a blivet is basically kind of a giant rubber bag. It looks like a big, round, um, yeah, it's rubber. <laughs> it's just a big, round bag. I don't know how else that you could say it, you know. Okay. Now, would those things break when you drop them or put them down? Or? Well, you don't drop them. Okay. We don't drop loads. <laughs> we know where we're supposed to put them. The, the pathfinders tell us, and we set the load down, bring the helicopter down lower, Release the hook, the sling, uh, the the line of the sling drops, and then we take off. Okay. But we don't drop loads. Right. Okay. Uh, and okay. then in the as, as the campaign goes on, sort of in, in April, in May, in June, before the actual bombardment or the siege of Ripcord goes on, um, what, were you still would you still take fire as you came in with the supplies? Sometimes, sometimes not. But yes, you could take fire. Okay. And when you did, you picked a different route in. Okay. Now, at this point, I mean, before things get really hot at, at Ripcord, was it much different there than anywhere else, or were there other fire bases where you had similar issues? Oh, yeah, there were always. We were shot at every day. Mm -hmm. Very seldom hit, but shot at, because we were either high enough or low enough. And you say, what do you mean by low enough? Well, if you're flying at treetop level, and some they can hear the noise of an aircraft coming, but they can't see, 
and there's a small opening above between the trees to shoot, and whoop, you're over it in a second. The higher you're out, the more they can see you because your vision actually extends up like this. So you've got to be high enough that the bullets can't hit you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, can you turn that on? I have to go to the bathroom. Okay. Right. Sorry. That's uh, okay. My All right. So we're kind of talking about just having to, to fly places un under fire and taking fire and uh, the kinds of different things that had happened depending on what altitude you're at and the dangers there. But most of the time if you're flying into a fire base, you can usually find an angle to approach from where they're right. not ready for you or they're making Exactly. Any and you or... never fly the same route twice going into the same fire support base. And we could have 20 loads that go in. So you go in at a different angle, different altitude, different airspeed all the time to keep from being shot up. Of course, at some point though you have to wind up at the same spot. Yeah, but hopefully it's hours later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you're going to a fire base or something, physically they're not very large. So right. you would expect that the enemy, if they could, might have weapons trained on it, or would they usually be farther away? Well, they're, they're not right on them. They're farther yeah. out shooting yeah. in. And if it's so bad around it, you do a high spiral down mm -hmm. over top the fire base. All right. Uh, now, how often would your aircraft get hit? Well, usually, you know, at least a couple of the aircraft would get hit every week mm -hmm. and then that cost you you had to buy a case of beer for the crew because they had to s spend the night fixing that aircraft mm -hmm. and have it ready for the morning and you had to buy the bar that night for the officers club so it cost you mm -hmm. but just think of all the nights you got to drink free too there you go <laughs> so okay it yeah. wasn't so bad all right now talk about what it's like to fly during those like last three weeks of the Ripcord campaign. Because bombardments really starts on a large scale, beginning of July, uh, and then you get three weeks that eventually you get eventually a disaster with a Chinook crash on top of the base and then the evacuation. So what do you recall about that period? Well, the best way I can describe it was what Randy Sutherland, his call sign was Playtex 1-8, just wrote in an email that when you go in to pick up a load you'd say um, Evans uh, so and so in to pick up a load and they'd say okay we've got a load of 155 for um, O'Reilly and you pick it up nothing but if they didn't say anything you knew it was for ripcord and then you know, the odds were you're going to get shot. So then you'd start hearing from the other aircraft, hey, can I have your stereo? Or can I have your camera? Can I have your wife? Because there was a good chance you weren't coming back. So that's what it was like. You knew you were going to be shot at. You knew you were, could be shot down. But you still had to do it. Mm -hmm. That was your job. And if you didn't, one of your buddies had to. So you didn't shirk your responsibility. And being the platoon leader, I couldn't. Mm -hmm. So So at this point you've been there long enough and you've got enough experience. You kind of worked. Oh yes, I was an aircraft commander. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so um, how does it change, how do the missions change? Once the bombardment starts, now what do you have to do differently or how much harder is it? It's just harder getting in without getting shot. You still had to do it. Still all those loads had to go in. In fact, there was more loads that had to go in because they were burning up more artillery shells and you were resupplying those constantly. Still had to take water in. Guys have to drink. You had to take pallets of uh, 
uh, food in so that they could eat. Uh, they were always improving their defenses, so you'd be taking Constantina wire and uh, flares, you know, just all kinds of things for them. And we were taking in the uh, anti, I tell you, these robocalls kill me, mm -hmm. the anti um, mortar, it was a uh, like a radar, so they could tell where the mortars were coming mm -hmm. from, so they could fire back and destroy the mortars. So we would take that in. And of course, that was constantly being hit, so we were taking the people in to repair that or replacing it. Mm -hmm. And the quad 50s, we were putting those in on the base. So that's what we did. Okay. Now, how many companies of Chinooks were involved? There are three companies in the battalion A Company, B Company, and our company. A company's call sign was Pachyderm, B was Varsity, and our company was Playtex. Our motto was longer lasting support. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, would you sometimes get help from other units that had Chinooks, or were, you, were your three companies basically it for Ripcord? We were it. We belonged to the 101st. Mm -hmm. That was it. Okay. And how many aircraft in each company? There are 16 Chinooks in each company, and eight per platoon. Okay. At any given time, how many of those would be operational? It depended on the maintenance people of the company. We had extremely good maintenance, 24 hours a day our maintenance shop ran, and we always had at least 12 aircraft flyable. And I think on the day that we pulled them out, we had 14 in it. Okay. B Company always seemed to have the worst maintenance. They never had a lot of aircraft flyable. So our pilots did a lot of work and flew every day. But every day they had to tell a battalion how many aircraft were flyable. Mm -hmm. And of course the last day, all available aircraft were put up. Okay. Now, um, how many aircraft did you lose in that campaign? Um, the battalion or my company? Well, both, I guess. I think the battalion lost, besides the one that crashed, on, uh, lost two. All right. We had been uh, talking, basically, about um, you know, flying into Ripcord and so forth, and... Um, your unit hadn't lost aircraft, but a couple of the other... No, they had been shot up, Yeah, but n not shot down. Okay. Now, at the point when the... Uh, no, you remember which company... The, there was one that was shot down on top of Ripcord on the 18th of July, which then blew up the ammunition and the artillery Right, that batteries. was a company, Pachyderm. Okay. Uh, now, where were you when that happened? Were you some, somewhere else, or were you nearby? I was somewhere else. Okay. All right. Um, and then, once that happened, did anything change, or was it just you, one day you get the order, we're taking them out? Well, number one, the story went around about what happened, about it being shot down, and the kid, the crew member with the aircraft rolling mm -hmm. over on him, and then they couldn't save him. Mm -hmm. He was burned to death. Uh, and how that all happened went around, and it was heartbreaking for everybody. Mm -hmm. It's a hell of a way to go. And, um, you know, we knew it was really hot on ripcord, so we assumed that we would be really starting to pour in a lot of ammo to replace the ammo that was blown up. Mm -hmm. And then um, we got word that we were going to pull it out the next day, and um, went to a briefing. As a platoon leader, I was at the briefing up at Camp E on what we were going to do. Boom, 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 and um, came back, made the list out of who was going to fly. Um, 
and how many aircraft we had available, how many pilots we needed, and told those guys, you know, not to drink so much that night. And did our job the next day. All right. Now, um, did that operation sort of look any different from your perspective than the others? Could you see the other aircraft flying, or were you far enough apart that it was still just another mission? No, because number one, you took off in the dark, mm -hmm. you flew up to Evans in the dark, and you circled. Mm -hmm. So you could see all the lights. And that was the Chinooks mm -hmm. doing the circling. Then you had your Hueys circling and your Cobras circling until we got, it was light and we were told to go in. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that's what you did. <laughs> okay. Now did you make a single trip or did you go back? I was shot up so bad the first time the aircraft was not flyable once we got it back to Evans and shot and shot, shut down. All right. Were you when you got there? Were you just bringing in personnel, or did they bring stuff with equipment? Or no, I was taking out a one five five. Okay. Um. So, when we were on short final, to the artillery piece, the whole world erupted in front of us. I mean. If you ever see the movies where uh, the, the old World War II movies where they were assaulting the beach and the whole mm -hmm. beach is nothing, mm -hmm. that's what it looked like in front of us. I mean, it was just blowing up, you know. So we did a quick pedal turn and continued in, picking up the 155, and then it started blowing up all around us. Blew our windshield out. We looked like Swiss cheese. It uh, blew our auxiliary hydraulics out. Closest I came to ever getting hit, it cut a piece of shrapnel, cut my sleeve. Mm -hmm. um, so we picked it up, flew it back to Evans, dropped it, shut down. When we shut down, holes were so big in our blades you could put your arms through them. So we called maintenance. They flew up with another aircraft. Now, it took time to go mm -hmm. from Fubai up to, to Evans. And they gave us that aircraft and then taped the wings up, or the blades up and so forth and flew that one back to be totally, repl not replaced, but a lot of work done mm -hmm. on All the blades had to be replaced. And so much uh, uh, body work had to be done. And then, you know, we took off, ready to go back in, but it was over. Mm -hmm. So we only got in once. Right. But that's, you know, for some reason God didn't want us to die that day. Now was that the worst um, situation you flew in in terms of enemy fire, or did you get equivalents in other places? That was the worst <coughs> I've ever had it. Now we, we got bullet holes, but nothing like that that just you know put holes in the blades you could put your arms through I never had anything like that they were shooting at us with mortars artillery 51 cal recoilless rifles I mean it was <laughs> and that was with a lot of Cobras and aircraft providing oh yeah and fast fire. movers were dropping yeah. napalm all over and bombs and they were still, they wanted to take that hill and destroy everybody on it. Mm -hmm. All right. <coughs> now, uh, what are some other uh, kinds of things that, that you do? You kind of talk about sort of the routine missions and the resupply missions and so forth. What are some of the more unusual things that happened while you were out there? Well, we used to do flame drops, which is basically where we drop napalm. So we would drop it on, on LZs that they were planning to do a combat assault to clear out booby traps and the spider holes mm -hmm. with anybody in it. And for those that don't know what a spider hole is, it's a hole that a, uh, an enemy soldier could hide in with a little bit of uh, grass or camouflage covering 
So when the people landed, they could just pop up and shoot them. That's a spider hole. Mm -hmm. And when you drop the napalm on that, of course, it burns it out and burns them up. So we made crispy critters. Um, when you were carrying the napalm, did you worry about somebody shooting at you? I mean, was that more dangerous than the other stuff you carried? They did, they did. You mm -hmm. just, you know, it was a mission you did. And you were high enough that you weren't too concerned about it, about being okay. hit. All right. Uh, so, uh, what and, other... And you, you were carrying it externally yeah. in a net. Yeah. The net okay. was tied to the hook. That's right. That's far enough below like the artillery yeah. ammunition was right. that as right. long as you're not sitting on it, you're okay. Right. Okay. So when you opened the net, the net still was tied to the aircraft. The barrels would fall out of the napalm and, and hit the ground and explode. Okay. Uh, and uh, you, you mentioned you, you encountered some Chinese. Yes, in the northern part of the Ashaw Valley, supposedly a Chinese engineer battalion was building a road. So our job was to go up and drop crystallized CS gas up there so that any time they would walk through, the CS would come up and make it unusable, unusable unless they wore a gas mask. Mm -hmm. So very uncomfortable. Now, of course, we didn't see them working during the day. I guess they did it mostly at night. But um, we went up there. Inside the aircraft was filled with 55-gallon drums of crystallized CS. So we had to wear a gas mask while we were flying, which is another nightmare. <clears throat> and the um, loach dropped a smoke grenade where we were supposed to uh, start dropping and we'd fly by and roll them out. They'd hit, burst open and spread the crystal ice. So that was interesting. Um, of course always picking up down aircraft is, is interesting and uh, taking them back to maintenance. And then during the monsoon the whole area flooded that was east of Highway 1 which is all low land and you know, very low, so it was flooding, and we went out to get the civilians and bring them to higher land. So you were flying, you know, the ceiling might have been 100 feet, and visibility very, very low. And uh, you went out and you rescued people. All right. Uh, now, did you, you mentioned you did some support for the uh, 1st Arvin Division up yes. there. Uh, did you have much contact with their personnel, or would you just fly in and drop stuff off like anywhere else? Um, we would transport their people a lot to the fire bases mm -hmm. and um, pull, them, pull them off when they were switching battalions. Mm -hmm. uh, we would resupply their bases just like anything else. So they'd be resupplied out of Evans or down by... Um, uh, Camp Eagle. Mm -hmm. So that was no different. No different than when we were supported the Marines on the DMZ. It's the same type of missions. It's just who you were working with. And it was interesting. You'd have the um, officer directing whatever it is that you were doing for the Arvins come in and they could speak broken English but uh, they'd like to come up to us, and instead of talking with a headset and the mic, they come up and grab your helmet around and stick their face in you and talk. Of course, you can hear them because they were also talking into your mic, mm -hmm. and it would come. But, you know, God, their breath with, the, <laughs> with that fish and nook bomb and all. Oh. <laughs> but it was hard to get them to use a headset and, and, and talk to you that way. They wanted to look you and pull your, they pull your, your helmet around. <laughs> so, okay. yeah, it was some of the funny things that happened. Now, as a pilot, you have kind of an odd existence in the sense that you sleep most nights on a proper base. You've got regular food service. There might be a shower of some kind available. You've got your club and that kind of thing. And then you're out there flying the missions, and so it can be very scary and dangerous for a while, and then relatively secure. Uh, what's life like on base? Boring. 
uh, you fly 12, 14 hours a day, three days on, one day off. Um, so you finish flying, the aircraft would be refueled, you fly it back to the revetment, put it in. Then you went to operations, debriefed, and then you were free for the evening. So you go and to the mess hall, or you go to the club, and you start drinking. And we drank every night. Every night. You either play cards, ping pong, volleyball, um, or darts, depending on the season. Mm -hmm. You know, you were playing volleyball during the monsoon season, but... You know, there was something, and everybody was sitting around talking about the day, talking about this, talking crap, and drinking, and they'd get drunk every night. All right. Um, now, did there, were there other kinds of drugs around at that point? Not in the aviation. Okay. The pilots are very clean because they can't afford to be like that because they're going to die if they mess up in the aircraft. Mm -hmm. You know, you're at... Uh, 8,000 feet and, you know, you pass out from drugs or you can't think straight on if there's an emergency on what to do to mm -hmm. save your life. So we've never had that problem. Now, of course, today they say alcohol is, is a problem. But, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22-year-olds were able to drink a lot, get a couple hours sleep, mm -hmm. and then perform the next day. Mm -hmm. Um, the enlisted people, not a problem so much with our crew members. Mm -hmm. Again, they had to make sure they were doing things right because when they were in the air, if they had messed up and putting a nut on and not tightening it mm -hmm. correctly and putting safety wire on it correctly, they were going to die. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have too much problem with that. Now, with the non-maintenance people and the uh, non-crew members, there were some problems. But other than that, not too big of a problem. Okay. Yeah. Another, you know, one of the sort of stereotypes about Vietnam and that kind of thing has to do with racial tensions, particularly on larger bases and things like that. Do uh, you notice any of that from your perspective? No. I, <sighs> Aviation, there were a few African Americans. Our company commander, Major Jones, was black. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a few black enlisted men, but most of the pilots were, were white. Mm -hmm. It's nothing against them, it's, it's just who was there. That's the way it was, whether the uh, African Americans didn't sign up for flight school and want to become pilots? I, I have no idea. But I just don't remember them. Now, there are more and more African American pilots, and there are some in our Vietnam Helicopter Pilots Association, mm -hmm. but again, very few. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have that kind of problem. I guess you aren't, you also weren't on a really big base with a lot of person. I mean, you weren't on Evans most of the time, or no. Uh, at Camp Eagle itself and that kind of thing. We have the larger groups of people who've been sent to the rear and that kind of thing. Right. So a lot of those sorts of issues, whether it's the, the, the drugs or race, would be affect your unit a lot less. Right. And our unit was kind of self-contained. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had everything that we wanted right there. The clubs, the club for the enlisted people, the club for the NCO, and mm -hmm. our officers club, all in there separate areas. Mm -hmm. So it just wasn't, you know, a problem. We all just depended on each other. It's not like we walked across the street to be with another company. Okay. And did people spend all their time on the base or was it possible to leave the base? And No. One, once, you could get once in a while a tour of way, mm -hmm. which I did one time, but you were on base 99.99% .99 of the time. Mm -hmm. okay. And did you have Vietnamese civilians on the base? Yes. We had the hooch maids, cleaned our 
quarters, shined our shoes, washed our clothes. Um, we had the um, person that cleaned out the latrines and burned the waste. Mm -hmm. um, he was commonly called the shit burner. Mm -hmm. He was, a, you know, and they made good money and they were happy to do this. You know, they were nice people. And, um, you know, they were making money and supporting their family. Now, that's not a job I would have wanted, mm -hmm. but... Yeah. Uh, did you have concerns that any of them were Viet Cong or anything like that? Well, you always wondered, but no. Okay. Now, while you were on any of those bases, uh, were there ever any problems with uh, harassing fire or anyone trying to get on them? Well, being the only infantry officer in our company, I was in charge of the Red Reaction Force okay. to run to the berm if we were attacked. Mm -hmm. We weren't. However, intelligence, which is...